All right, it's great to be back here at home, at the home church. Missed you guys for the past week, um, but I went out and I was able to, to visit with other churches, other like-minded churches, and you get an opportunity to go out and visit these places. I was just in Oklahoma City, I was just out in LA, and um, you know, basically the same spirit among the people out there that love God and that want to serve God. Um, uh, it's really good to go out and be able to, to visit these places. And it's an encouragement, encourages me every time to go out and, and um, fellowship with, with other Christians. Now, um, obviously, I just mentioned the announcements, the events that just transpired. It was late Friday night, early Saturday. Saturday morning, really, is when, is when that bombing took place. And yes, a bombing took place on a Baptist church, an independent, fundamental Baptist church. Uh, based on, look, the news is going to say, we, you know, we don't know why and all this other stuff. They have to say that because they're still investigating and they don't know, you know, without knowing for certainty, you know, they're not going to just start making the accusation, but we all know who did it, right? Now, not specifically, not the actual person, right? Not the individual, but we know why it was done. It was done solely based on the preaching. It was probably some sodomite or some sodomite lover. I mean, either way, uh, you're going to have somebody that's, that's doing that. I would say it's a sodomite and um, that is just full of rage and hates the Word of God and is trying to scare God's people. And, you know, I want to start off just by saying any Christian that doesn't want to drive the sodomites out of the land needs to start reading and believing their Bibles. That's right. Because you've been brainwashed. If you claim to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you claim that you believe that the Bible is the Word of God and that this is the perfect Word of God, it's preserved for us, it's not the Word of man, it's the Word of God, then you know what? The Bible speaks a lot about sodomy. It talks a lot about the reprobate and the sodomite. Okay? And it is, there is no uncertain uh, stance that God takes about this issue. Amen. There's no uncertainty on this at all. Read your Bible. I mean, seriously, I'm going to quote just a few passages. That, uh, before we even get into 1 Kings, right, the leaders of the, of the nation of Israel, we already see how God portrays the Sodomite in Genesis 19 with Sodom, right, where, where the term comes from. Right? The place where, where people now are called Sodomites, the reason why is because they are just like the people of Sodom. Right. That's right. The people of Sodom that went after strange flesh. They're queer. They're homos. They're fags. Okay? That's what they are. Sodomites are queers or fags. Same thing that you see today. The same type of people that existed back then. And what happened in Genesis chapter 19? You had two angels coming into town to stay with Lot. And what did they try to do? All the men in the city gathered round about the house and were pounding at the door and saying, hey, bring those men out to us that we may know them. That's how wicked and perverted these people are. And that demonstrates what can happen to a place when it's wholly given over to sodomy. Now, when they're in the closet... When it's looked down upon, when it's despised, when people hate that, you're not going to have an entire city surrounding a house and demanding that you bring out these, you know, this, these men that they may know them. But the more their power and influence grows and their cancer spreads throughout society, the more powerful they're going to become and then their true colors are going to show. And as I said on, on Thursday night, you know, the true colors isn't a rainbow. It's not pleasant. It's not light. It's dark. Okay, it's evil. It's wicked. Which is why, time after time after time, first of all, it's not just Genesis 19. Judges 19 is almost a reiteration of Genesis 19. Different context. You've got a man and his concubine staying at this guy's house. They just want to stay there for the night. And then the men of Belial, the men of Satan, the Sodomites, want to defile the man again. They're coming, banging on the door and saying, you know, bring him out to us. And just to appease them, they end up, you know, letting the concubine, giving her out to them. 
because they're implacable and unmerciful and they end up defiling her until they, until they kill her all night long until she dies. This is how God portrays the Sodomite. Okay, you've got two witnesses, Genesis 19 and Judges 19. This is what we need to know about them. Notice the Bible doesn't tell you, oh, about that nice flaming little queer that you just are supposed to love and invite to church and everything else. You're not going to find that in Scripture at all. In fact, what you find is like in 1 Kings 14, 24, where the Bible says, and there were also Sodomites in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. So everything you read about in the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter 20, it goes through all these horrible sins and things that are worthy of death. It says that the, the nations that were there before them, they did those things. And then it reiterates, guess what? The Sodomites in the land, they do all those things. Genesis 19, Judges 19, 1 Kings 14, also another reference. Romans chapter 1 says the same thing. That when God gives up on someone, when he rejects someone, they're given over to do all those things. And then in 1 Kings 15, 11, the Bible says, And Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David his father. So here we have a good example of a king. And he says, He did right in the eyes of the Lord. What does the very next verse say? And he took away the Sodomites out of the land. Amen. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, and he took out all the Sodomites out of the land. Amen. Hmm. I wonder what the Bible teaches about Sodomites. I wonder what we should do. Should we invite them into church? Should we love them? No, he did that which was right and he drove them out of the land. Amen. Read your Bibles, people. Stop being influenced by the damned media and this damned world and the satanic you know, propaganda out there trying to get you to believe that, oh, they're just, they're just sinners like you and me and we just need to love them and we need to help them and they're just misunderstood. No, they need to be driven out of the land. Amen. They need to be driven out of the land because they are enemies of the gospel of Christ. They're children of the devil. Okay, and they, they, they should not be tolerated or allowed. In any God-fearing country, they wouldn't be. And then we have Jehoshaphat, again, doing the same thing. He did that which is right in the eyes of the Lord, 1 Kings 22.43 says, and 1 Kings 22.46 says, and the remnant of the Sodomites, which remained in days of his father Asa, he took out of the land. He ended up finishing the job that Asa didn't quite complete. He did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord. So look, this is taught in Scripture very clearly. Now I also want to be clear that it is not our jobs, and I'm not advocating to go out and start exterminating sodomites and taking the law into our own hands, because that is not our job. And that is not what the Bible calls for either. These men that drove out the sodomites out of the land by force were kings. They were in that power and had that authority to do so. And I'm not going to teach completely on the authority structure that God set up, but God did set up, Romans 13 talks about, the powers that be are ordained of God, and he ordained a human government to enforce the law against evildoers. And sodomites are evildoers. That's right. okay? And it is the government's responsibility and job to punish evildoers. It is not, it's, it's out of order. You're out of your realm of authority to go out and just take the law into your own hands and execute judgment and justice yourself. And the Bible is very clear on that as well. And I want to make sure I'm very clear on that also, that people don't just take what I'm saying and just run with it and saying, oh, well, I'm just going to go and do this now. Right. We are not called to fight the physical fight at all. Our fight is, our battle is a spiritual one. Now, we are going to stand in the face of physical persecution. You better believe it. But we're not going to engage in a physical battle. We're going to stand. We're not going to go on the offense, physically speaking. We go on the offense by preaching the Word of God. Because you know what? That's more powerful than any 
sword or gun or anything else anyways. What we, what the, the victory for us would be the people's hearts and minds turning to the Lord and rejecting children of the devil. Everything else will play, it, will, will play out the way that it needs to. We started in 2 Timothy chapter 3. These events, while they may be shocking, really shouldn't come as a surprise overall. It is a wake-up call. Okay, and people need to be aware of this. And we've been preaching about this. I've been preaching about this for years. But when things get real, it's time to really open up your eyes and see, okay, this is what you've been talking about. Yeah, that's right. This is what we need to prepare ourselves for. It, when it's abstract and everything's going great and everything's going fine and, and you're living life and, and everything's wonderful and everything's bountiful and you're being blessed, you can read about these things. But there's something missing when it's not just actually happening. You're not seeing it. That's right. Now you're starting to see it. And look, the reason why we keep preaching and warning is so that you can be prepared. So that it doesn't just come and be like, whoa, man, okay, I didn't sign up for this. I'm out of here. Which unfortunately, some, you know, some people may end up doing that. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. I hope not. I pray not. Yeah. Okay. But that's the goal of the scare tactic. That's what, that's what terrorism is all about. It's trying to scare people into, into not doing something anymore. But over and over and over again in Scripture, and I picked out one I think that is very applicable and very pertinent is 2 Timothy chapter 3. But in many places in the New Testament, you see the warnings of the persecution, of the tribulations. You read about it. Read about the apostles. Read about what they did. It's real. Okay. And when you live godly and when you're going to serve the Lord, you will face that opposition. You will face it. And we're going to see that here in this passage. Let's start reading. Let's go, uh, and we're going to go through this entire chapter because the entire chapter is applicable. Starting in verse number one, the Bible says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Perilous means dangerous. Okay, I don't know about you, but I believe we're in, I know we're in the last days. Now, I don't know exactly how long, you know, how far towards the actual end we are, but we're definitely in what's considered the last days. For men, verse 2, shall be lovers of their own selves. And talk about, what, I mean, I'm going to start applying this to today just so that we can realize this and not be shocked when you hear about the things that are happening now. And not be shocked if something else happens. And not be shocked when persecution comes our way. See, we're going to support them and stand with them in their time of need and trial. It's going to happen here too. That's right. It's going to happen here too. Be ready for it. Now, maybe not exactly the same way. I don't know. I don't know. But it's going to happen here too. So be ready for it because we live in a time where men are lovers of their own selves. I cannot believe how self-centered people are in society. are, And, and it, it's just become more blatant and obvious and social media doesn't help when you see, I mean, everybody doing their selfies. Everybody, it's me, 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 me. Look what I'm doing. Hey, everybody, how many likes can I get? What? All about self. That's the, the path that our society is, is on. All about me. You know what? That's a shame. According to the Bible, you, it, it sh you shouldn't be ever lifting yourself up and wanting and just be the center of attention. Everybody look at me. You're supposed to be humble. Right. You're supposed to be, oh, I, you know, I'm nobody. I'm going to help you out. I'm going to help someone else out. But when you have this selfish, self-centered attitude... It's going to lead you to more wickedness. Men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, right? You want all these different things. Because again, that goes hand in hand with being a lover of your own self. Being covetous. You just want things for yourself. Boasters. You lift it up with pride. Proud. Blasphemers. Disobedient to parents. Unthankful. Unholy. Without natural affection. There's your sodomites. They don't have natural affection towards people. 
it's unnatural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, you're going to be prepared to see a lot of that as well. If you've been reading any of the news reports and things about the church, about First Works Baptist Church, you'll see the lies. You'll spot them. It's pretty easy to spot. There's all kinds of lies and slanders out there. I, I saw one post, one article saying something that, uh, that Pastor Mejia said that Jesus was against interracial marriage. <laughs> I'm like, they got it completely wrong. And then, and then they tried to put this quote of him saying about the heathen, right? Now look, you know what I preach on, on marriage. I just did a sermon on interracial marriage. Pastor Mejia believes the same thing. But this is what the media does. One, I mean, I think it's mostly just because they're blind, right? They, they don't even understand these things at all. So they, they just hear what they want to hear. But it's still a lie. That's right. It's still untrue. They still just try to, to you know, list all these things to make people hate them. So that way, even the bombing, well, whatever, people don't get all upset about it. Because they can see, oh, well, I mean, I shouldn't really care about this person anyways. False accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Turn away. Don't welcome in. Turn away. I mean, look at all these attributes. They're fierce. They were fierce in Judges 19. They were fierce in Genesis 19. And again, given the opportunity and the more, the more boldness they think they can get because, because of their influence and because of their acceptance, the more they're going to do. They won't stop. Verse 6, for of this sort, this type of people, these proud, proud, they were gay pride, they're proud. Of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now, as Jannies and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Just in case you weren't sure, based on all the other attributes that were listed there, he just comes out and says they're reprobate concerning the faith. They're rejected concerning the faith. They could learn as much as they want. You could try to give them the gospel as much as you want, but you know what? They're never, ever going to be able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They won't be able to do it. They won't be able to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because they're reprobate concerning the faith. That's why you see the same attributes listed that you do in Romans chapter 1. That's why you see the same attributes listed here that apply to Genesis 19 and Judges 19. It's the same people. They're haters of those that do good. They resist the truth. Verse 9, But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. It will become manifest. It will be made known. And they start to un unravel and, and uh, let themselves be known. And they will uh, over time. Verse number 10, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Look at verse 11. Persecutions, afflictions. So he's saying, you know, he's, he's telling Timothy, you know how I've been, my doctrine, my faith, my long-suffering, you know, all these positive attributes. But you've also known my persecutions and my afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra. So it wasn't just, oh, I was afflicted in this one place just because there was bad people there. It's all over the place because there's wicked people everywhere. And the more you're doing for the Lord, the more enraged and furious they're going to be. He said, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. There's your reason not to fear. Fear not what man can do unto you. Fear him that's able to cast both soul and body into hell. Fear him. 
We fear the Lord. But we don't fear what man can do unto That's us. Right. Look at verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. This is applicable for you as well. This is a heavy topic, heavy topic, a heavy subject matter. But take it seriously and take heed. Because yes, right now we're comfortable. There's things happening to someone else. We're comfortable. Even the little bit of, of persecution that I face personally from, from the news story or whatever, that didn't blow up, that didn't get big, there wasn't some big mob outside, there wasn't anything that resulted as, you know, from that. But it's coming. It's coming. Because the world that we live in isn't getting any lighter. It's getting darker. And as we continue to grow stronger and do more, be ready for the persecutions. They're coming. Be prepared. Don't forget these verses. Don't forget what the Bible's teaching here when the hard times come. Because verse 13 says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. This is going on. We're witnessing it. They're going to get worse and worse until they end up like Sodom end up. Which is also why when we see in you know, Matthew 24, it's just like in the days of Sodom, that that reference is in there, right? Before Jesus Christ comes back. Just like in the days of Noah, and again, in the days of Noah, what happened? People were extremely wicked that God had to bring his judgment down. In both instances, God just, the, the only solution then was just to wipe people out. Yeah. Because the people had overall just become reprobate. She said, you know what? There's no, there's no fix in this. They just have to be destroyed. Just like the land of Canaan. God's command was just destroy them. In that instance, instead of using supernatural means, he used people to do it. And guess what? When Jesus comes back, he's going to take his people out, just like he took Lot out, just like he took Noah out, and then the rat's going to come down. And God is very long-suffering. So when that happens, guess what, guess what the world's going to be like? We are rapidly headed towards that time. The evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse. Be ready for it. Now, I don't say this to discourage you. I say it to prepare you. In fact, it shouldn't discourage you of anything. Hopefully, it's going to motivate you to want to do more. To try to stay off the evil men and seducers that wax worse and worse. To try to, 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 to shine the light so that the darkness doesn't encroach any further. That we can stay off and we can stand in the gap and make up the hedge and, and say, no, you're not going to keep getting worse and worse. And we could stand there and, and make that defense and, and try to make that defense for our children and for the world to come. We know ultimately it will happen, but we can do what we can do here. And regardless of how bad things get out there, that doesn't change what our objective is. It doesn't change what our mission is. It doesn't change what our job is from the Lord. Verse 14, but continue thou, so even though evil men seduce get wax worse and worse, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast, made, thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, Throughly furnished unto all good works. Turn over, if you would, to Philippians chapter 1. So in light of the warnings, in light of the evil people out there, you still need to continue in the Word of God.
Continue in the doctrine. Continue in the things that you've learned. Don't back down. Philippians chapter 1, verse number 27 the Bible reads, Only let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that whether I come and see you or else be absent, I may hear of your affairs that ye stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. This is instruction to the church of the Philippians here. Hey, stand fast in one spirit. Stay tight-knit. Stay in one spirit, stay in one mind, and strive together for the faith of the gospel. Maintain the course. Keep doing the work. Verse 28 says, and in nothing terrified by your adversaries. Hey, stay strong. I know they may be trying to plot and plan to bomb you, but stay with it and don't be terrified by your adversaries. Don't be terrified by them. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be scared of them, which is to them an evident token of perdition, but to you of salvation and that of God. For unto you it is given in behalf of Christ, not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. So you know what you've been appointed to? Not only to believe on him, right? The Christian life is more than just believing on Jesus. Now, that's all it takes to be saved. It's all it takes for God to redeem your soul is to put your trust in Jesus. Amen. That's a free gift. But you know what? Once he's saved you, once he's redeemed your soul, you know what? There's something that he has for you to do now. Not only, it's not, you know, he doesn't want you just to believe on him. His plan is that you believe on him and start doing some works. And live for him now. And offer yourself up a living sacrifice. Amen. And also to suffer for his sake. Because once he saves you, now start following his example. Now start walking in the steps of Jesus. And you know what the, the, where the, the steps of Jesus led to? It led to the cross. It was selflessness. It was humility. It was serving and ministering unto others to the point of self-sacrifice and not loving own self even unto death and be willing to die for the cause. Amen. That's true Christianity. We don't go out seeking problems, right? So don't, don't take that the wrong way. We're not going out trying to see, oh, what can I do to make people hate me? That's not, the, it's not the objective. We're not trying to make people hate us. But, but here's the thing, and don't confuse the two, because we are trying to preach the truth and shine a light. And when you do that, especially in certain topics, you are going to make people very angry. And you are going to make people want to hurt you. But you know what's more important? is making sure that the truth is told. And that we don't back down from that. So some people might look at you, oh, you're just trying to cause trouble. Oh, Pastor Shelley with the sodomite deception, he's just doing that to get attention. And to, you, know, you know what he's doing it for? Because the world needs it. Amen. Because this truth obviously needs to be taught. If people are going to get that angry about it, then it's that much more important. We don't do it because we want people to hate us. We don't do it because we want to just have attention. We, we shine the light because the light needs to be shined. Because what the Bible says, it's the truth. If it, was, if it was just something out of his own heart or my own heart or whatever, then yeah, I'm open for criticism all day long. If it's just my own personal thing, well, you know, I just think this. No, no it's what God's word says. That is the light and that's what needs to be shined. And when you do that completely, you're going to make a lot of people angry. Does anyone think that Jesus did a bad job of shining the light? He is the light. The light of the world is Jesus. He is the light. And when he shined his light, what was the response? Crucify him. Crucify him. Did that make him back down? Did that make him say, oh no, maybe I should change the way I say things. Maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe I should. Nope. 
He did it anyways, full well knowing. We need to have the boldness and the courage to understand that, yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, to understand that and do it anyways. Because it's not about me. It's not about my comfort. It's not about how, how comfortable I can live here and how many things I can have and how much food I can eat and, and how much I could just live at rest. That's not what it's about. It's not what it's about. If that's all you're striving for, then, then you need to, to reevaluate your own priorities. Because that's, that's going to end up being a vain existence for you. You can achieve that, I'm sure. You can achieve a comfortable life. You can just focus on making money. You could focus on doing that and building a nice little house for yourself and having a few cars and doing whatever it is that, that's going to make you feel happy or what you think is going to make you feel happy. And you could sit around your house and you could do nothing and you can have all kinds of nice conversations with people. You know what? At the end of the day, your life is going to be empty and meaningless. That's right. That's right. Because you're not actually doing anything. Because once you start doing something, doing something that matters, doing something for God, people are going to start hating you. Hey, I didn't, you know, I, I, that's just the way it is. That's reality, folks. Lines are drawn. There's good, there's evil. Okay, there's light and there's darkness. There's both. So until Jesus comes back and sets up his kingdom, that's going to be the way things are. And we need to be aware of it. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which ye saw in me and now here to be in me. So you guys are going to suffer like me. And we under, need to have the mindset and understand that if you're defamed for Christ's sake, if people are going to slander you, that's a victory. We don't look at the persecutions as defeat. Those are actually victories. Why? What do you mean victory? Why? Because God is going to reward you tremendously. Why do you think Jesus Christ has a name which is above all names? I mean, the Son of God, right? He did everything perfect and right. He, he, he humbled himself and as a result, his name is exalted above every name. If we humble ourselves in the sight of God and we allow ourselves to suffer persecution, partake and just, just get a little taste of what Jesus did for us. Hey, I mean, wouldn't you want to be that close to Jesus? I know I would. Let's, let's, let's have, I mean, think about how much more appreciation you have for the person who makes the sacrifice for you when you start making sacrifices. And just understand this, that this is why, and, and you know, rightfully so, there's you know, people who end up fighting in wars, right, physically fighting, have a different perspective on freedom and on other things than the people who don't. Because they're making sacrifices. They're, they're doing things. They're putting their life on the line and maybe even becoming injured and everything else for a cause. Now, I don't agree with all the wars that are going on, with any of the wars that are going on right now. I think it's all corrupt and you've got some evil people behind all of that. But my point is, you know, you still have that different appreciation, that different perspective when you start making the sacrifices. And you start actually feeling it and, and going through things. Now, the reason why I bring that up is because it's a, it's a real sense where you could, you know, people maybe understand that a little bit more. When we start suffering like Jesus suffered, it's going to make you appreciate the sacrifice he made for you even more. I'm sure, I don't doubt that any of you are, are unappreciative of the sacrifice that Christ made for you. Right? We, we, all, we all are very grateful and love him for that. But you know what's going to bring you and draw you even closer when you start suffering for him? And the more sacrifices you make and the more persecutions that you face, you're going to realize, man, this isn't quite as easy as I thought. And Jesus did way more. And Jesus suffered way more. 
And one, that should hopefully encourage you to help you keep going, but also give you more respect and love towards the Lord to see, wow, he endured this. And, and you know, when you endure those things, it's going to strengthen you. When you let that terrify you and get you out, it's going to shame you. And anyone who's a child of God, you will end up being ashamed. Don't be like Peter when he denied the Lord three times. What happened to Peter? You know, Peter said, no, nope, I'm with you to the end. And the Lord said, you know, this night, you're going to deny me thrice. Three times you're going to deny me. And why? Because he was scared, right? The, the, the authorities came in. The soldiers came in. They arrested Jesus. Everyone ran. Everyone took off and they fled and they left him there alone to face his persecution alone. And now there's all this uncertainty. Oh man, they have Jesus. What are we going to do? And Peter wants to see what's going on, but he doesn't really want to be right there with him facing that persecution himself. He just kind of wants to see how things happen. So he kind of sneaks in. Hey, wait, aren't you one of his disciples? No, no, who me? No, I, I don't know him. I don't even know that guy. And when Peter denied him three times, you know what the Bible says? He went out and wept bitterly. Bitterly. That bothered him. Of course it's going to bother him. He was saved. Okay, look, he wasn't an unsaved person at that point. You say, but he denied Christ. Yeah, it was wicked and wrong. He denied him, though, because he was scared, because he allowed fear to creep in, because he still had that flesh, and he succumbed to his, to his flesh and the fears that, that were going to you know, potentially come on him physically. He was still born again. He was still a child of God. And this is the Apostle Peter who did all kinds of great things. So let's decide, I don't want to be ashamed. I don't want to weep bitterly. I don't want to be ashamed of myself and my lack of being able to stand for the cause of Christ because of these persecutions. I want to be able to be in good company with Jesus and not let these things affect me. Right? Even though they're going to affect you, do not let them affect you to the point of getting you out. Right? And backing down and standing down and denying the Lord and saying, okay, you know, just basically giving up. Because here's the thing, when it comes to Christian's life, the only way to lose is to give up. And just say, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. And that's what the attacks are meant to do, is to get you to give up. But here's the thing, you've engaged in this battle, there is no really getting out. And here's the thing, when it comes to bullies, because that's what the evil, the children of the devil are, that's what the sodomites are, they're bullies. When you back down, it's only going to make them attack you more. That's what bullies do. You know, the, 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 the kid at the playground who's scared and fearful because, oh man, there's this strong kid, he's coming to me and he's, he's telling me, give me, you know, give me your lunch money or whatever. So I'm just going to satisfy him, I'm going to appease him, and I'm just going to give him my lunch money so that way he, he doesn't bother me anymore, right? What happens? Well, now he's going to come back every day and start demanding more and more and more because he knows he get away with it now. That's what bullies do. And that's what they do, you know, when you have these, these you know, semi-celebrities or celebrities and they say anything bad about the sodomites, then they want you, oh man, you got to apologize, you better take back that statement, you know, and then when they do, now it's, well, you got to fire this person, and, you know, and they continue to go after them because they're unmerciful and implacable. That's right. They have those qualities, they have those attributes. So don't think that once you've engaged in the battle that you can just back down and, and, just, and just say, well, now I'm neutral, now I'm just going to get out and, and everything's going to be fine because it won't be. How about you just retain your integrity Man up, deal with it, okay? Get a little bit closer to Christ and his afflictions and his persecutions. Know that you're in good company. Get the rewards later on in heaven when you're standing before the judgment seat of Christ and he's doling out rewards. He says, wow, you kept the faith. You did a good job. Hey, you did things that really mattered. Hey, you encourage other people by you standing strong. Thanks. How much encouragement are you going to have? I know I have tons of encouragement when I go to a church 
and I see First Works Baptist Church, and I see, you know what? They're still going strong. They're still going out every week. They're still preaching the gospel. Pastor Mejia is still preaching the same messages in light of all the persecutions, in light of physical danger, in light of all these things. They're still standing strong. Hey, that's an encouragement. Amen. 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 When you're willing to say, hey, I'm still going to stand on, on the word of God, that encourages and edifies so many other people. That's why God rewards you for that. You're blessing others, and you may not even be thinking about that at the time because you're focused on all these problems that are going on. But that's the impact that you have. That's the influence that you have. That's why it's so important not to back down. Imagine the amount of influence that the Apostle Paul had with all of his persecutions if he were to just back down and just say, you know what? I'm sick of being arrested. I'm sick of being beaten. I'm sick of all of these problems that I face physically in this life. I'm sick of it. I'm done. What would that do to all of the churches and all of the people that he reached with his ministry? What damage would that do unto them? And look, we all have our own scope and realm of influence with people. If nothing else, every single one of you that's in this church are going to impact other people in our church. If nothing else. But you have influence outside of this church as well. When the persecutions come, don't back down. Not for your sake, for their sakes. For our sakes. And look, when the persecution comes on me, don't back down. Because I'm going to need your support. And now, more than ever, as a group of believers, just as a body of believers that believe on, on the things of the Bible, now is not the time to be getting out of church, folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now is not the time to be taking breaks. Yeah, now is the time to be getting in and getting more involved and doing more for the cause of Christ. When these attacks come, hey, it's even more important now than ever to be sold out for the Lord. Amen. We need to be strong. We need to show our strength. We need to be going out and doing the work of the Lord and, and not caring what's going to come our way. Amen. Have the boldness. Have the faith. Continue to fight. And look, I'm, I may be saying things like, you don't even realize because you haven't gone through the persecution. It's coming. It's coming. I can see it coming. I've slowly been trying to warn about this because you can see the events unfolding. You can see it happening in the world. Turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm going to read for you from chapter 2. Now you could turn to chapter 2. I guess it, it's, it's only one chapter off. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Don't be intimidated by the bullies. First of all, most of them are just blowing smoke anyways. Most of the threats and everything else, most of them, 99.9% .9 of them, will never happen. They try to scare you and intimidate you and get you to back down. But as the days get darker, we're going to see more, I believe, physical persecution. And, you know, and I thank God that no one physically has been harmed. But the days are coming, you know, the, the, the more the sodomites are going to gain in power if they continue to, which is why this battle is so important. Which is why it's so important to, to spread the truth. Which is why it's so important for, you know, people like Pastor Mejia not backing down. Why it's so important for people like Pastor Shelley putting out the sodomite deception. People like Pastor Anderson, you know, aids the judgment of God. All these different things, all these different ways, you know, whether it be through just, you know, preaching, online media, whatever it is, getting the word out there, getting the truth out there is important. And you know what? If it wasn't having influence, if it wasn't having an impact, people wouldn't be upset by it. It's a true token knowing that what you're doing is having an impact. It's reaching people. When you start to feel the persecution, you're doing something. You're doing something. Verse number 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, the Bible says, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before, and were shamefully entreated, as ye know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. 
So again, I, I've mentioned this before. Over and over again, you're going to see the references to being persecuted. You're going to see, hey, look, there was a lot of contention. There was a lot of fighting. But you know what? We were still bold in our God to preach the gospel unto you. You know how we suffered. You know how we were shamefully entreated. You know how people despised us and talked bad about us and reviled us and lied about us. But we continued and were strong in our God and preached the gospel anyways. We continued moving forward. Chapter 3, verse number 1. The Bible reads, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. So they're sending Timothy to go ahead and say, You know what? You know, we're, we're staying here at Athens, but we're going to send Timothy to you because we want you to be encouraged. Why? Verse number three, that no man, man should be moved by these afflictions. He said, we need to encourage you because all these afflictions that are happening, we don't want you to be offended. We don't want you to get out of the fight. We need to make sure that you're encouraged so you can keep moving forward. For yourselves know that we are appointed there unto. It's not a surprise. The persecutions happen. You need to be encouraged by that, especially people who are weaker in the faith and haven't faced this and don't know what's going on. And let's face it, if a church is growing, we should always be having new believers and people who are growing in their faith that it's going to be a lot easier for people who are babes in Christ to get scared and to get out of the fight than it is for people who are more seasoned and grounded in their faith and settled, which is why it's important to be encouraging everybody. For verily when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation even as it came to pass and ye know. We need to support those being afflicted and support those that are weak and remind them that these things are going to happen when you're doing the right thing. Jump down to verse number 7. The Bible reads, Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. Showing that support to the people on the front line by staying faithful is important. As the Bible says here, I already mentioned this, but the people who are up there facing the most heat are the ones that are comforted when they could see your faith. Just like the Apostle Paul says here, look, we were comforted in our affliction, in our distresses by your faith, seeing that you're still remaining faithful, even though we're suffering all these things by these people. The Apostle Paul suffered, you know, tremendous things. But when he could see people still remaining faithful, that is an encouragement. That's a comfort. And he says, for now we live if ye stand fast in the Lord. Because to the person who's minded on other people, that is going to do more damage. So when, when, for the person who's ministry-minded, and cares about people. When the world or when the heathen is out there persecuting them, it's not as bad because you're focused on the well-being and, and you know, the children of God and trying to encourage and, and help them. So when they fail you, that is much more damaged. That's much more discouraging. When they quit, when they get out, because that's where the heart is, right? The heart is on these people. The heart is on the children of God. The heart is on ministering to these people. So yeah, when, when children of the devil persecute you, Whatever. My heart's not with them anyways. Stay faithful. Because you're going to help encourage and support. And like he says, for now we live if ye stand fast in the faith. Don't leave the man of God when the attacks come. Turn if you would to 2 Timothy chapter 1. It's the last place I'll have you turn. And you know, these are the real attacks. I, I was thinking about this when all this stuff went down. Because I, I remember just recently with all the coronavirus stuff and, you know, and people getting all up in arms about, about church services and everything else. And look, I'm not trying to downplay, you know, the importance of church or, or being able to go to church or whatever. But I started seeing people sharing like John MacArthur stuff and like kind of posting this support because John MacArthur is making the stand. John MacArthur is a, a, a false prophet. That's right. Amen. 
he's a Calvinist. Now, and, and some of the people I've seen just sharing this stuff by John MacArthur are saved people. And I'm starting to wonder now, are these people going to be showing the support for Pastor Mejia, who's actually facing a much more severe battle than John MacArthur? When, when the enemy is literally throwing bombs, are, are you going to be supporting him? Or do you just like the politics, the politics game, because you know there's going to be a lot more people who are going to agree with you when, you when you can share something and share one of the world's prophets and, and go that route. Yeah, that's a lot more comfortable, isn't it? Because when you make a stand against the children of the devil, you know that persecution's coming your way. And unfortunately, these days, that's why so many churches aren't making that stand. And that's why we're in the condition we are today. Because the people who were supposed to be filled with the Spirit, who were supposed to be bold, who were supposed to be preaching against these things, who were supposed to be shouting from the rooftops, silenced themselves right. in this area. Right. Because they were afraid because they didn't know what to do, because they didn't want to face the attacks, because whatever their reason is, ultimately it's based out of fear and the spirit is departed from them, the spirit of boldness. Now we're in a darker situation. It is what it is. Not going to complain about it. We still have the same job to do. And you know what? Maybe that just means then more rewards for us when we, when we are in a condition and can stand up and fight against this. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Not only is standing with the man of God, standing with the people on the, on the front lines, you know, a comfort to them and a help to them, it will also turn out to be a blessing to you when you remain faithful, when you stay the course. Look at verse number 13, 2 Timothy chapter 1. The Bible reads, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. Now, this is the Apostle Paul saying, Look, everyone's turned away from me. They're leaving the Apostle Paul high and dry, right? Persecution came and now Phygelus, Hermogenes, all they which are in Asia, they turned away. We don't know Apostle Paul. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's an extremist. We're not, we're not like him. Don't be fooled. And, and this is kind of another subject, but don't be fooled by the people who are going to try to creep in and get you to distance yourself from the man of God, from someone who's got the same spirit as the Apostle Paul, from someone who's going to be willing to stand up and put it all on the line and suffer and receive that persecution. Don't succumb to that. I had, I had a lot of pressure and influence from people in my life when I was going to Faithful Word back in the day, back when the first protests started happening there. Back when, because for so long, I mean... I don't know, and, and, and I'm sure it's happened somewhere, but I just didn't know about it. But hearing of churches being, being protested against was almost unheard of. I mean, yeah, you've got Westboro Baptist Church, but they're, just a, they're, they're a whole other breed. All right? They're, they're this group of lawyers that are out trying to just make lawsuits and make merchandise of people. And they're a bunch of unsaved Calvinists anyways, but... Other than that, you don't hear about any real big waves from churches. So when I'm going to church and they're on the news and there's these protests and everything else, the pressure is there from people to make you want to distance yourself and, and kind of leave the pastor just up high and dry. Oh, yeah, he's kind of, I'm, you know, yeah, I go to that church, but, you know, I mean, I, I don't believe all that stuff or whatever. Don't do that. Okay, if you, if, you, if, you, if you really don't believe it, whatever. But if you believe those things, 
Don't leave that person who's, make, who's actually making the stand publicly just hang out there all by himself because you're worried about your job, because you're worried about what other people are going to think, because you're worried about what your family's going to think. Don't, that's going to that's bring shame. I wouldn't like to look at myself in the mirror. If I would have succumbed to that pressure and just been like, oh yeah, he's kind of nuts. He's kind of out there. You know what? Stand with him. Support him. And look, you don't have to be in lockstep with every single you know, little detail or thing or whatever. Stand with him. Show some loyalty. Loyalty to Christ and loyalty to the man who's, who's, who's there to help you and, and feed you and and you know, feed you spiritually, do these things for you and look out for you and watch out for your souls and, and feed you with good spiritual meat. Look out for that person. Stand with them. Okay, don't be looking for all the little things. Pastor Mia mentioned this when I was in church there on Thursday. He was, was kind of speaking to the church and, and, and helping them and, and instructing them on, on the battle they were going to be facing today. Um, and he made a really good point. He's saying, you know what? You know, if there's something that you're offended by in a preaching or whatever, you've got some, you know, some problem here or there, he said, now's not the time to leave. He said, wait a few months and then go. But, but you know what? Right now we're in the middle of a battle. Now's not the time to leave. And the point is, is having that unity and being brought together. And, you know, un unfortunately, sometimes people just get really bent out of shape over little things. You've got a huge battle going on it's not time to start nitpicking all the little things. I'm sure it's, it's happened before, and I usually don't find out about it until way later if I ever even do. I'm sure there's all kinds of people in here that, that have problems with the way I do things, with something that I've taught, with something here, there, whatever. I don't let the kids do this, or I don't do this, or what, whatever, right? These stupid things that don't ultimately really matter. You don't like the way I run the soul winning. You don't like the way I do it. Whatever. Okay? But when you face the battle, it's not the time to be worried and concerned and, 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 and focusing on those little minutia. In fact, it's never the time to be all bent out of shape over those little things anyways. Just deal with it. But definitely not when there's a big battle going on. We need the people of God to come together and be unified as one man and one spirit, fighting against the, the wicked forces of this world. You say, Pezzarus, what are we going to do? We're going to keep doing the same thing. Just more. We need to keep spreading the gospel. That has always been and will always be the primary focus, is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ to a lost world. That is the number one objective and focus. We're also going to just preach all the truths of God, all the counsel of God, without holding anything back. And the things that, are, that are, need more attention are going to be getting more attention. The truths that need to be preached even more because of how bad this world is are going to be preached more and more. But not to leave anything undone. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse number 13. The Bible reads, Hold fast the form of sound words, Hold fast, right? Hold on to it. Don't let go. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. This thou knowest, that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me, of whom are Phrygellus and Hermogenes. The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain. So here we have the Apostle Paul saying, you know what? The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus. God bless Onesiphorus because he wasn't ashamed of me and he wasn't ashamed of me being in prison. He wasn't ashamed to say that he knew me and to stand with me and to refresh me and to come and visit me and to help me out even though publicly I'm ashamed because I'm in prison. Right? It's not a glory to be in prison. It's a shame. Right? Does anyone want to be like, yeah, I'm in prison? In no. No one wants to be cast off into prison and just lumped in with a bunch of criminals and people who, you know, are in there for other re for legitimate reasons. And you know, these days, there's a bunch of people who are in prison for illegitimate reasons, but 
it's still a shame to just be in prison. So he's saying, you know what? He's not ashamed. He's standing with me. Why? Because when you're in there for the right reason, we're in there for the cause of Christ, there is no shame in that. But when people are worried about how other people think, especially the people of the world think, or the children of the devil think, then you're going to distance yourself. Oh, I don't want to have anything to do with them. But the Apostle Paul said, you know what, the Lord? Give mercy. He's praying to God. This man of God who's standing up and, and has the ear of God because he's standing right there with him is praying for the Lord to give mercy unto his house. Verse 17, but when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, thou knowest very well. When you support, you will be supported. This goes back to the, to the same understanding and truth that you're going to end up reaping what you sow. When you can help other people out and when you can strengthen them, when you can encourage them, when you can not be ashamed of them and their bonds, when you can minister unto people, you know what? In your time of need, it'll come back to you too. And the Lord won't forget those things. And the people who are being blessed by you in a the moment, they're going to be praying for you too. So the Apostle Paul, he, he remembered Onesiphorus. He's like, you know what? He came to me. He visited me. God bless him for that. There's a blessing. There's a blessing in retaining your integrity. There's a blessing in standing with, with the people who are, who are fighting the good fight, who are contending for faith. We need to be unified. We need to be strengthened because, you know what, maybe we're not facing the heat of the battle right now, but we will be. Let's make sure that we're ready. And let's make sure that we can help out other brothers and sisters in Christ who are in the battle right now. Support them. They need it. So yeah, Stronghold Baptist Church, we're going to support First Works Baptist Church in every way that we can. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us eternal life. Lord, for, for saving our souls. We thank you for entrusting us in, in, with the gospel of Jesus Christ, with the ministry of reconciliation, Lord. It's a, it's a big burden to bear, but we thank you for giving it unto us. Lord, we want to be found faithful and good servants of yours. And Lord, we know that, that along with this job that you've, you've tasked us with, there will come persecutions. There's going to come tribulations, Lord. And I pray that you would help us all to be strengthened, help us as a church to be strengthened, to be of one mind, of one spirit, that we're, we're all here gathered together, dedicated to serve you. Lord, I pray that you please continue to add to our church, to bring more laborers, that we can be at full strength as a body. And Lord, we also ask for your blessing and encouragement and, and boldness and strength of the spirit to be upon uh, First Works Baptist Church and all the church members there and all the people and Pastor Mejia, Lord, keep them safe from evil. God, help them to just continue to do more. I pray that you please uh, um, help people be stirred up to serve you even more. And Lord, I pray that you would just um, confound the wicked, confound the children of the devil, dear Lord, cast them down as, uh, as evil. And I pray that you would just uh, bless the way of, of first works and, and help their path to be prosperous, dear Lord. And, and again, here, dear God, help us to, to just stand fast in the faith and to do the work that you've laid out for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.